uh, Secretary of Defense, Ash Carter. Sir. Terrific. Well, uh, thank you, both Joe and Bill, uh, for being here, <clears throat> for that introduction, for your friendship, and for your enduring commitment to public service. First, over nearly four decades in uniform, culminating in your leadership of our Special Operations Command, and now as Chancellor of the University of Texas, and also a member of DOD's, I'm pleased to say, new Defense Innovation Board. Thanks, Bill. And thanks to everyone here at Capital Factory. Uh, uh, this morning, Josh, where's Josh? There you are. Josh, thanks You're for being part of the inspiration of this day. Uh, appreciate it. Representatives from this community's bright constellation of innovative businesses, universities, and government institutions, thank all of you for joining us here today. It's great to be back here in Austin to formally announce that our technology startup, DIUX, Defense Innovation Unit Experimental, is expanding yet again and extending the Department of Defense's outreach to America's technology community. Given this city and this region's deep commitment to innovation, and also, I should say, this state's deep connections to those who serve, we couldn't have picked a better place than Austin, Texas. I created DIUX last year because one of my core goals as Secretary of Defense has been to build and in some cases to rebuild bridges between our national security endeavor at the Pentagon and America's wonderfully innovative and open technology community. That's important because we've had a long history of partnership, working together to develop and advance technologies like the internet, GPS, and in the era before that, satellite communications and the jet engine. What we've done together has not only benefited both our security and our society, but it's fair to say the entire world. And that cooperation between industry, the academy, and government helped make our military what it is today, the finest fighting force the world has ever known. There's no one stronger, there's no one more capable, there's no, more, no one more innovative than we. That's a fact, and it's one that every American ought to be proud of. But it's also a fact that our military's excellence isn't a birthright. It's not guaranteed. We can't take it for granted in the 21st century. We have to earn it again and again. And today, it's imperative we do so because we live in a changing and fiercely competitive world. Technology itself is an example of that change. When I began my own career in physics decades ago, most technology of consequence originated in America, and much of that was sponsored by the government, particularly the Department of Defense. And to, now today, we're still major sponsors, but much more technology is commercial. The technology base is global. And other countries have been trying to catch up with the breakthroughs that for the last several decades made our military more advanced than any other. Nations like Russia and China are modernizing their militaries to try to close the technology gap. And meanwhile, technologies once possessed only by the most advanced militaries have gotten into the hands of previously less capable forces and even non-state actors. And at the same time, our, our own reliance on things like satellites and the internet can lead to vulnerabilities that our adversaries are eager to exploit. So to stay ahead of all these challenges, to stay the best, I've been pushing the Pentagon to think outside of our five-sided box, to invest aggressively in innovation of all <coughs> kinds in our technology, in our operations, in our organizations, and in the talent management of our all-volunteer force. One way we're doing that is by pushing the envelope with research and development in new technologies like data science, biotech, cyber defense, electronic warfare, undersea drones, much, much more. And we're making some serious investments here. Just to remind you, the latest budget I've proposed will invest $72 billion in research and development next year alone. And that's more than double 
what Intel, Apple, and Google spent on R&D last year combined. So it's a big investment. Another way we're investing in innovation is through people to ensure that we continue to attract and retain the most talented young Americans for our force of the future. As part of that, we're building what I call on-ramps and on-ramp, off-ramps for technical talent to flow in both directions. This will let more of America's brightest minds contribute to our mission of national defense, even if only for a time or for a project. It will also allow more of DOD's and the defense industry's innovative military and civilian technologists, and I should remind you that there are many of them, to engage in new ways with our country's larger innovation ecosystem, especially the parts that may have no experience with or even have hesitations about working with defense. Now, innovative technologies and people are necessary, and that's why we're building bridges to them. But technology and people also need innovative practices and organizational structures, so we're investing in them too. The world we live in demands it. While the Cold War was characterized by the slow and steady accumulation of strength, with the leaders simply having more, bigger, and better weapons, today's era of technological competition is characterized by the additional variables of speed and agility such that leading the race now frequently depends on who can innovate faster than anyone else. And it's no longer just a matter of the level of the technology we buy more than ever. Well, what also matters is how we buy things, how quickly we buy things, whom we buy them from, how rapidly and creatively we can adapt and use them in different and innovative ways. All this to stay ahead of future threats and future enemies. And to ensure that we keep adopting more innovative practices in the future, I recently created the Defense Innovation Board to advise me and future defense secretaries on how we can keep growing more competitive. It's chaired by Google Alphabet's Eric Schmidt. And the board members we're recruiting represent a cross-section of America's most innovative industries, organizations, and people. People like Amazon's Jeff Bezos, LinkedIn's Reid Hoffman, Code for America's Jennifer Palka, astrophysicist Neil deGrasse Tyson, and also, as I mentioned earlier, Austin's very own Bill McRaven. I've charged Bill and the rest of the Defense Innovation Board to keep DOD imbued with a culture of innovation in people and organizations and operations and technology to support innovators themselves, the people in DOD and the strong companies that already work with us who are willing to try new things, who are willing to fail, fail fast, and to iterate, and to make sure we're always doing everything we can to stay ahead in this changing and competitive world. At the outset, I've given them the very specific task of identifying innovative private sector practices that might be of use to us in the Department of Defense. Not unlike our recent Hack the Pentagon, pilot program, which you may have heard of, which invited white hat hackers to help us find vulnerabilities in our networks and report them to us, similar to the bug bounties that several of America's major companies already conduct. So while this approach to crowdsourcing cybersecurity is fairly widespread in the private sector, our use of it in the Pentagon was the first in the entire federal government. And it was so successful, we're expanding it to other parts of DOD. It's the perfect example of the kind of recommendations I'm looking for from the Defense Innovation Board. Things that are out there that we might be able to use. Now, of course, not everything in the private sector is going to make sense for us because we're always mindful that military isn't a company. It's the profession of arms. And for, for, so for important reasons, we're not always going to be able to do everything uh, the same way that others do. But that doesn't mean we can't look ourselves in the mirror. doesn't mean we can't look around the country for new ideas and lessons we can learn for ways we can operate more effectively. So the board will recommend a first slate of innovative practices in the fall in time for me to review and determine which ones make sense for us to adopt. And I have no doubt that we will. Finally, one more way we're in innovating, investing in innovation is by developing new partnerships with private sector, the private sector across America's many great innovation hubs, unrivaled in the world. Places like Boston, Seattle, Silicon Valley, and of course, 
here in Austin. And that's why we and DIUX have come here today. Over the last 12 months since we first opened the doors of the West Coast office of, in Silicon Valley, DIUX has been a signature part of our outreach to the tech community. And it's been enormously productive. We've already iterated launching DIUX 2.0, as we call it, in May, under the leadership of Raj Shah and his fellow partners. We've expanded to Boston, where I opened the DIUX East Coast office in July, and Raj and his team are already bringing in game-changing technologies that are going to benefit America's warfighters. They've closed five deals just in the last three months. It took an average of just over 50 days after they first interacted with a company to award these funds. That's fast, especially for the Department of Defense, and appropriately so. And they have another 22 more projects already in the pipeline for an additional $65 million in areas like network defense, autonomous seafaring drones, and virtual wargaming. Today, we're building on that progress with a new DIUX presence here in Austin to join and complement our East and West Coast operations. Time, coming here made perfect sense. The Silicon Hills of Central Texas have long been a hotbed of scientific and technological innovation from the garage inventors and dorm room entrepreneurs who follow in Michael, Depp's, Michael Dell's footsteps to the startups nurtured in incubators like Capital Factory right here to the researchers and grad students breaking new ground on campus at UT. But this is also a state with deep connections to the Department of Defense and to our mission of defending our country and our people. Texas is home to over a dozen military bases, including some of our largest and most populous, like Fort Bliss and Fort Hood. Texas is also where some of our longstanding and highly innovative defense companies are located, manufacturing key platforms like the Marine Corps' most, Corps most modern attack and utility helicopters, the AH-1 Zulu, and the UH-1 Yankee, Venom so-called, as well as our most advanced stealth fighter, the, J the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter. And the Army's high mobility artillery rocket system, or HIMARS, which I'll remind you we're using more and more in our coalition campaign to deliver ISIL a lasting defeat in Syria and Iraq, which we surely will do. Texas is also the home of many service members, military families, and veterans. In fact, Texas has one of the highest numbers of veteran-owned businesses in the country, including dozens of startups right here in Austin. So bringing DIUX to Central Texas and to Austin was a logical step for us, and we're fortunate there are two important organizations here, institutions, really, that can help us get established in the area. One is right here, Capital Factory where DIUX personnel will start off by working part-time from the co-working spaces here, hopefully benefiting from the close proximity to Austin's center of gravity for innovators. And the other institution is the University of Texas, which of course has given rise to generations of inventors and innovations in advanced computing, data visualization, robotics, energy engineering and design, and more. One thing that's unique about our presence in Austin is that it will help expand DIUX's national reserve element, which is led by Navy Reserve Commander Doug Beck, right there, a decorated combat veteran who served in Iraq and Afghanistan. Doug's a very busy guy, especially right now. In his civilian life, he's vice president for Apple, reports directly to Tim Cook. But I'm grateful he could join us here today and for his continued leadership at the DIUX West Coast office. From there, Doug's been leading a great team of citizen soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines, all of whom provide unique value to DIUX, since many of these patriots are tech industry leaders and entrepreneurs when they're not on duty for us, for DOD. We're looking to benefit from some, such talent even more in Austin, because here, DIUX will build its ranks by recruiting proven local innovators who already serve our country in the National Guard and the Reserves. Once they come on board, they'll serve part-time, that is, in their regular reserve capacity, to help connect the broader DIUX enterprise with local and nearby companies that are developing promising technologies with potential customers across our Department of Defense. They'll work in close coordination with the DIUX partners based in Silicon Valley and in Boston. And if this model continues to succeed, 
We are going to look to replicate it in any other innovation hubs around the country. The X in DIUX is well past proving itself as an experiment, but it won't stop experimenting. Now, to help us get this new DIUX out outpost up and running, I've handpicked a leader who was recently one of DOD's most creative and talented senior civilians, Christine Abizade. Chris, Christy Abizade, right over there. I asked Christy to be our point person here, not only because of her proud legacy of service to our country, but because she's proven to be an innovative thinker and an innovative leader everywhere she goes. In the Pentagon, at the White House, and on battlefields halfway around the world, Christy has always been looking for better, smarter, faster ways to get things done. Until just recently, Christy was our Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Central Asia. Lovely places. <laughs> Sir, serving as one of my most trusted policy advisors for what you will all recognize as a critically important region. And I know she'll do a great job spearheading DIUX's presence in Austin. And joining Christy will be local reserve members, starting with First Lieutenant Samantha Snabs, right there. Before joining DIUX, Samantha's been serving in uniform as an intelligence officer in the Mississippi Air National Guard. In civilian life, she's co-founder and CEO of RE3D, a business she started here in Austin to support affordable industrial 3D printing innovations. Lieutenant Snabs, who's also worked at NASA and with DARPA, is a great example of the innovative people we already have in our military's ranks. And I'm sure more Austin-based reservists like her, like her will be joining DIUX soon. And before you know, Christy and her team will be reaching out to all of you here. They'll want you to help them understand the technologies you're working on, They'll want you to help you understand how those technologies can support our men and women in uniform and contribute to defending our country. You tell us what you're doing, we'll tell you how it can help. They'll be our ambassadors to you and a way for you to connect back to us. So I hope you take the time to get to know them and even better, to work with them. This is a very exciting and portentous time. For those interested in foreign policy and national security, there are lots of interesting challenges and problems to work on with us. And that's also true for those interested in technology. But the intersection of those two, what matters and what's new, is an opportunity-rich environment. Let me explain what I mean to, by that, because there are opportunities for partnership in every challenge we face. Right now, right now, as we sit here, in this room, our men and women, women in uniform are working with partners from our worldwide co coalition in more ways and with more and more power every day to accelerate a lasting defeat of ISIL, which we will surely do, and we want to do soon. They're training with our NATO allies in Europe to deter Russian aggression. They're also sailing the waters of the Asia Pacific as part of a principled and inclusive network of nations, ensuring that the most consequential region for America's future remains stable, secure, and prosperous for all nations. They're standing guard 24-7 on the Korean Peninsula, countering Iran's malign influence against our friends and allies in the Middle East. And all the while, they're helping protect our people here at home and helping to make a better world for our children. In each of these missions, you and technologists like you can make a difference too. Because whether it's machine learning technology that might be able to recognize and block ISIL's barbaric ideology on social media, or algorithms to help a self-driving boat track submarines, or biotech research that could one day help our troops recover from injury faster, technology is a critical part of everything we do. And it's critical to addressing every challenge we face today. I want to close by saying that I know many of you in this city take pride in keeping Austin weird. <laughs> so let me assure you, I not only want to keep Austin weird, I'm counting on it. <laughs> because the creative thinking that happens in places like Austin is part of what makes our country so innovative and our economy so vibrant and strong. And I know that with DIUX in town, it'll also help our military remain the best in the world. Because when it comes to America's national security, we can't afford to be complacent. Our competitors are trying to out-innovate us, which means we have to be willing to think a little differently. 
That's how we've succeeded in the past. Thinking differently put us in space, put us on the moon, put us computers in our pockets and information at our fingertips. And it's how we'll succeed and prevail in the future too, ensuring the safety of our country and our fellow citizens for generations to come. That's why DIUX matters. It has to do with our protection and our security and creating a world where people can live their lives, dream their dreams, and give their children a better future. Contributing to that mission, helping to defend this great country and to make a better world is one of the noblest things that a business leader or a technologist or an entrepreneur or a young person can do. And we're grateful to all of you here for your interest in doing that with us. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary Carter, uh, Chancellor McRaven, uh, and everyone else who joined here for these comments. Uh, obviously, we're so excited that Secretary Carter plans to expand the DIUX presence here to Austin in addition to Silicon Valley and Boston. Uh, I kind of like hearing those three names together. Silicon Valley, Austin, Boston. And uh, I, th I think we're going to hear those three more and more often. Uh, Austin was recently ranked the number one startup metro in the United States by the Kauffman Foundation for the second year in a row. We're one of the fastest growing cities in the country, and we are attracting educated entrepreneurial millennials who really want to change the world. In fact, that's the motto of UT Austin, what starts here changes the world. Now we have leaders like Mayor Adler and Senator Watson working hard to make sure that Austin continues to be the place where everybody wants to live and to work. So it makes a lot of sense that the Secretary uh, we choose Austin as this next location. I'm looking forward to finding ways that we can contribute the talent and technical skills being developed here in Austin to help our men and women who serve in the military. And I think this, this announcement is one more reason why Austin is going to remain one of the top startup hubs in the U.S. Uh, you know, uh, off script a little bit, but you know, I, we, I, I teach a class for student entrepreneurs at, at UT. I just meet so many people here, and I, there are so many great entrepreneurs, and they really do all want to change the world. But a lot of them don't really know what problems to go solve. And maybe they end up building an app to do something that you might think wasn't solving a really big, hard problem. And one of the most exciting things to me about this is the opportunity to expose them to real problems that are life and death that affect all of us in so many different ways and, and expose them to the opportunities they have to, to really make a difference uh, in a much bigger way. And, and I think that's the most exciting thing coming out of this. So uh, I'd like to thank, uh, in particular as well, everybody on the Capital Factory staff, the DIUX staff, and the DOD staff who helped make all this happen. As you can imagine, it takes a lot to pull all this together. Uh, and you guys, everybody rose to the occasion. And I'm really, uh, really pr proud to be in Austin and proud to be a Capital Factory today for that. So thank you all for coming to do that. That's going to end our formal part of the program. Uh, actually, it's not going to end the formal part of the program. We're going we're gonna to lose the secretary. Uh, and he's going to go along with the formal press who've been invited back for, to the back room this way. And we're going to take a break to move them right now. We'd like everyone else to stay here. And we're going to be having Isaac Taylor come up to give a further detail about DIUX and answer any of your questions about how it works. So let's take just a quick break for the press to move through to the back. And if everyone else could stay seated, we do have one more speaker. I was came here as dean of engineering from Berkeley, so I know the Silicon Valley. Oh, thank you, Secretary. Really Chris, we're already connected. Good. Good to be there. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
All right, I'm going to try to keep us uh, on schedule here and recognizing everybody else who's waiting. So I have many, many distinguished guests up here at the front who I don't feel very comfortable hustling, but I'm going to have to ask to, uh, to take your seats so that we can continue with the, uh, the presentation here. Yes, in particular all these people. All right, so uh, next up I'm going to introduce Isaac Taylor. Uh, Isaac uh, is one of the, the partners leading uh, DIUX. He joined DIUX after 13 years at Google, and I think you'll notice a trend here where many of the great leaders of these programs came from the military, but many of them also came from industry. And, uh, and you'll see it's, it's, they, they're plucking some of really just some of the best leaders uh, at Google, at Apple, at many of the other lead places in the tech industry who see this ability to have an impact and, and join this mission. Uh, there at Google, he was the founding head of operations for Google X, another X. Basically, X means all the cool shit. Um, and uh, Isaac's worked on some of the most ambitious projects at Google, including self-driving cars, internet via stratospheric balloons, Google Maps, and Project Glass. So I'm now going to hand it over uh, to Isaac, and he's going to be able to both tell you a little bit more about DIUX and I think be able to answer questions as well. All right, thanks. Um, which microphone should I use? I noticed we've been use using both. Use that one, that's for the press. Got it, okay. Can everybody hear me okay? No. So uh, I'm a nerd, uh, therefore I don't write speeches. <clears throat> this will be casual remarks. Uh, the goal is to explain a little bit more about what we do at DIUX every day and how we do it. Um, I want to clarify that um, we will do questions, but we're going to do questions face-to-face -face after this rather than live and interactive. Um, I'll be here all day along with Samantha, Christy, Sean, and Chris who are all here from DIUX. Um, it's great to be back in Texas. The last time I was here I was actually recruiting for Google as we were staffing up new teams and new projects for Google X. And um, I have long understood there's a lot of talent here. I'm now looking forward, it's an honor to be here representing DOD and DIUX to begin the process of recruiting new technologies. And this combination of talent, technology, and the opportunity to collide um, together uh, new solutions with, uh, in some cases, new problems, but frankly, too often old problems. Um, we're looking for new solutions to all sorts of military problems, and that's the essence of what we do every day at DIUX. It, it's not tech scouting. It's not um, venture capital investing. It is a kind of particle collider, right, of opportunities. And when we, um, I was appointed to DIUX approximately 100 days ago. Um, it's been very busy. Uh, I've been on the road probably more than 50% of that time. Um, the, as the parent of small children, I appreciate my wife taking care of them while I'm sleeping in a Motel 6 mm -hmm. in uh, Tampa or San Diego or Virginia Beach. Um, I have been all over the country meeting military communities and learning as much as I can about how we can help bringing in new technology from the private sector. And I think it's a target-rich environment. Um, there are a lot of capability gaps um, in need of new ideas, new solutions, new technologies. So let me um, talk you through how we do that. Um, <clears throat> when I was at Google, frankly, it was easy. Um, you can hire people, you can um, fund a project, you can start a program, and you can do everything that you want as an innovator in stealth mode until you know for sure whether your technology, your product, your team are going to change the world, at which point you can decide if and how and when to launch it. But we don't have that um, luxury at the DoD, right? We work in different ways. We acquire technology in different ways. And that process is um, elaborate, you know, complicated, well understood. Um, 
it has tremendous strengths, uh, the predictability of the federal acquisitions regulation process. Um, it, it has strengths and weaknesses. One of the weaknesses is that it uh, can be slow. It can also tend to filter out some of the most promising technologies. And I'll say, um, not as a Googler, but as a um, former private sector innovator, uh, that, that frankly working with the government was often a last resort, not the first idea for how you grow your business, um, but something that you do after you've already built your product, built your business, um, built your P&L. Um, DIUX exists to change that. We exist to make it more straightforward for innovators, entrepreneurs, and investors to work um, with DOD, with DIUX specifically, in ways that are a natural fit for how the private sector works. We can move quickly, we can move quietly, uh, and we can move through the delicate process of negotiating a business deal in traditional ways, ways that are traditional in the private sector. So for example, um, some people might think that if you work with the DOD that the government is gonna end up with all of your intellectual property. Uh, that is not the case at DIUX it's um, completely negotiable whether the U.S. government, whether the American public is going to end up with IP rights. Um, innovators, especially investors, may assume that when working with the government, um, the government is going to put its foot down and insist upon certain features or aspects of a product or business model. That's not true. Um, we're specifically not interested in um, encouraging pivots from what a startup would think of as its critical path or go-to-market strategy. What we're doing instead is accelerating companies down that critical path, accelerating the way in which they fulfill their own pre-existing sense of what they want their business to be, what they want their products to be. Um, lastly, we're not gonna waste your time, right? Time is ultimately the most um, limiting factor. It's not capital. Um, it's actually often not people. Startups, uh, uh, frankly, often have the pick of the litter recruiting. And um, in Silicon Valley, it is now the case that um, in many um, situations, employees would prefer a startup to a large company. Um, what startups don't have is, is an unlimited amount of time. Uh, they have a finite amount of capital, a um, very specific laser focus on their business model, their goals, their deliverables, what in the startup world we'd call the minimum viable product <clears throat> is a sprint, you know, not a marathon. So DIUX is um, intensely aware of how important it is to not waste time. And our, the first contract uh, that we awarded at DIUX, um, soup to nuts, was 31 days. Uh, that isn't as quick as the fastest venture capital deals, which can be done over lunch, but it's in the ballpark. And when I say 31 days, I mean 31 days from the first pitch, the first you know, PowerPoint deck, to a wire transfer, money in the bank, not a contract being signed, but funding. Um, so, you know, some of this, frankly, was a surprise to me as, as an innovator, as an entrepreneur. The idea that DOD doesn't need um, intellectual property, doesn't need 18,000 pages of contract line item terms and conditions, um, this is really exciting. And I think it, bu it busts some myths about what it's like to work with DOD. Um, fundamentally, what we're, what we're trying to do is to place advance orders, right? We're not making equity investments. DIUX is not a VC shop. We're not diluting the ownership or control over a company. The capital we're deploying it is capital and it is deployed, but in the form of advance orders, which function a little bit like targeted R&D grants to accelerate companies, innovators, and investors down the critical path to the goals they already had. What we ask for in return is a kind of option value on a percentage of the product coming off the line if it's hardware. You can easily, easily envision the um, finished goods coming off the line. Typically, DOD wouldn't have that option value. Um, my brother-in-law is a Marine. Uh, he uh, deployed repeatedly to Iraq. And when he came home, he described how the most useful thing that he had when he was 
interact was his GPS. Uh, you know, not his weapons, not his vehicles, not his communications gear, but his GPS. And in fact, his wife had purchased him the GPS at REI and mailed it to him in Iraq. And he said he used it every day. It kept him alive every day. It got him, you know, unlost every day. And, and he still has it, you know, all these years later. On the other hand, um, there are still spouses out there buying GPSs, right, for their warfighters and sending them downrange. And, and, and that is exactly the type of problem that we're looking forward to fixing. Because it ought not to be the case that you can go to Best Buy or REI and buy a better GPS, right, or a more convenient GPS than the one that the Pentagon is developing for our troops. That's the type of scenario where we will work at DIUX here in Austin and around the country to understand what innovations are coming in the GPS sector, in mobile consumer electronics. What is the state of the art, not for what is for sale right now, but for what will be for sale, right, next Christmas, maybe the Christmas after. We'll be working very carefully with startups and non-startups, but in all cases, non-traditional defense contractors, to very carefully understand how we can help them with their businesses and how they can help us uh, with our strategic goals. Comparing our warfighter needs, you can think of them as unmet capability gaps, with the roadmaps for products, hardware, software, technology, that will become manifest over the next 18 to 24 months, and to create that option value for uh, DIUX, for DOD, for America. Does that make sense? OK. Um, so what is DIUX not? OK, it's not um, FAR-based contracts. It's not a protracted negotiation process that then leads to a competitive bidding process, right? It, uh, what we do after um, assessing, harvesting, documenting, listening very carefully to military capability gaps is to curate those themes across the services um, without regard to the branch of service or the color of uniform. Um, we listen for, for themes that can be condensed into an actionable technology gap. And then we post these to our website. Um, through the commercial solutions opening process, we can make a request, in essence, for technology proposals that will close those capability gaps. Uh, we then meet the companies um, that have, um, you know, invited us to come evaluate their technology. Uh, well, frankly, we get a lot of um, a lot of inputs, a lot of submittals, and um, we're incredibly picky about where we spend our time and the public's money. This is the area in which DIUX is most like a venture capital shop, that we do a lot of technical diligence, and we do a lot of diligence into the viability of the company, the product, and the business model that is being proposed to us. Because we're contemplating working closely with a company that is a non-traditional defense contractor, and the process for bringing their technology into DOD evaluating it, testing it, transitioning it to the warfighter, that process will take time. Um, there, there is a risk that the tech or the company won't be there in a few years, right? So we're very careful uh, n not to invest in things, invest by which I mean targeted R&D grants, not VC investments. Very careful not to invest in things that are going to fizzle or that probabilistically just aren't going to work out. Um, when we do see an opportunity, then we move very quickly. And in some cases, um, we might receive 100 uh, submittals to a particular commercial solutions opening post and move forward with zero. Um, in other cases, we might receive only three if it's a, a very difficult problem for which few companies have something to suggest. And we might um, actually bet the field in that case and we'll move forward with all three. Uh, that will have some correlation to what in the um, venture capital world you would think of as this stage, as you go from angel to seed to A and B rounds and so on. Um, the earlier DIUX gets involved, the more likely it is it will be a small investment, and the more likely it is there'll be multiple investments. Conversely, the later it is in the TRL or technology readiness, the more likely we are to move directly into a kind of acquisition rather than an R&D grant. Does that make sense? Um, 
So since the end of June, we've awarded five contracts worth about $3.5 million. Um, as the Secretary said, the average um, latency from first contact to contract being funded was about 50 days. First was 31. Um, in general, we aim for sort of 60 days end to end and are you know, um, proud of the fact we're operating inside of that envelope right now. Um, there will inevitably be projects that are slower, and there will be projects where the way that we measure success is not the velocity with which we execute the contract, but the velocity with which the technology matures and transitions to the warfighter. So I don't want people to think we're overly focused on the pace of um, doing deals. It's ultimately the pace of shipping results that matters. And um, as the Secretary and others at DOD have explained in the past, we have divided the team um, conceptually into three groups. Um, these are the engagement team, which fundamentally does things like this and explains who we are, what we do, um, how you work with us. <clears throat> there is also what we call the venture team that um, rapidly um, deploys capital, makes orders, investments. And uh, in general, the venture team is working with technology that is ready to go, ready to use. Um, this is often software, not always, but often. And conversely, when working uh, on the foundry uh, side, we're often working with hardware that needs a little more work to do. So those three teams uh, constitute the DIUX approach. We're happy, proud to be bringing that to Texas and uh, look forward to working with you all here in the community. Samantha, Christy, Sean, Doug, and I will be here uh, for the rest of the day. Please uh, come ask us any questions you have later. And there are food and drinks uh, in the back room. Thanks. That's a wrap. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you.